Last week, I began the faith challenge, and we began talking about Andrew, Peter, James, and John, and how they were kind of, for lack of a better word, part-time Christians. No, that's, that's not what, right. They, they were part-time followers of Christ. They, they, they had yielded part of their life to serve the Lord, and part of their life, they were still doing what they had always done. They were making up a, uh, their minds on what it would be to be a follower of Christ. And that's what all of us are going to do. We're going to make up our mind how we're going to follow Christ. To what degree is our discipleship, our fellowship in Christ? How far are we willing to go? Where do we put the, the limit on it? I'll give this much, but the rest of it's mine. And the Lord used a, a wonderful example. He brought them there and got in John, uh, Peter's boat and pushed out a little bit from the water and preached to everybody. Then he turned around to Peter and said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And y'all know the story. We talked about it last week. He was tired. He was weary. He had fished all night. He had caught nothing. nothing. Yet at your word, I will do it. Did he catch anything? I believe he did. Enough to fill up two boats. Those people who had fished their whole life had never seen a catch like that. I only have one phrase. Oh, what God can do. Oh, what God can do. He is, we, have a, we serve a God in heaven who's not a miser that wants to hold back, but he wants to pour forth his blessings. Y'all understand that's what heaven is? Heaven is all the other things out of the way, and God for eternity gets to pour out his best on us forever. Forever. And he'd like to do that down here on earth if we'll let him. So our fellowship, our discipleship, do we have a fixed mindset? Do we say, this is as far as I will go? This is as far as I will serve? Lord, I'll let you in this much? Or do we have a growth mindset to where we can be taken as far as the Lord wants to take us? What a ride that is. Well, today we're going to see part two and I told you last week, we're really going to kind of focus on Simon Peter. And though what we're going to look at today is in all four of the Gospels, by the way, and is for all the disciples, but we're going to see how Peter started to learn there was something more that God wanted for them that they had caught on to. So we're going to see this faith challenge move forward a little bit. Now, when we get to Matthew 14, this is the stage. A little earlier, Jesus had got the disciples and he separated them off two by two and he sent them out. He gave them authority. The Bible says he gave them power to preach, to minister to needs. That meant like Jesus, they could heal the sick, the power of the anointing of God would be that when they spoke, people could hear God, not them. And God did the miraculous things. You think they were scared to death? Casting out demons? Healing people of all kinds of sickness? They were just as surprised as you and I would be. Well, they came back. And, and they began to tell Jesus all the magnificent and wonderful things that God had done in them, but through them. And, and they celebrated together, and the crowds were there and were pushing on them to a certain place. The Bible says in Mark's account of this that, that they did not even have time to eat. Jesus had gotten some words too. He, he had found out that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed by Herod. And it was a difficult time. They were tired. They were weary. Maybe even worn down and a tinge depressed. You know, when you get tired, that can happen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So Jesus said, let's get away. Let's get away by ourselves, so we can rest for a little while. 
So they get in a boat, and they go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, but the, the people found out Saul and followed them on ground to the place that when they got there, they were already there waiting from all the areas. And that's where we pick up today. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? We're going to begin in verse 13. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And I love this phrase. And he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. I, I've told y'all before, I, I went through the New Testament one time, and every time I saw that, those words, Jesus was moved with compassion, I underlined it because every time Jesus was moved with compassion, something big was about to happen. And that's what's about to happen here. When it was evening, the disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. 5,000 men with their families, women and children. You give them something to eat. Ladies, I know y'all can cook. Would you like to cook that meal? Mm. They said to them, we have only here, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke and gave. Blessed, broke, and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. And they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets, which of baskets full of the fragments that remained. Let's pray real quick. Father, this is your time. Every moment is your time. But Lord, we've, in our hearts and in our bodies, we've, we've come to this place and we've sung your praise. Now we open up your word and we ask you to speak. And I pray, Father, as pastor, they don't need to hear me, but if you could take your word and speak to their hearts, Lord, I can speak to ears, but you speak to hearts. And I pray that you will open up our mind and our eyes and our thoughts if you could just roll back the curtains and let us see Jesus today. Let us see your glory. Let us hear your spirit. Let us be drawn to you. Let us understand what faith is, that you are the source of our everything. You are the object of our faith. Our lives are for you, and you are Lord of all. Bless us today, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Jesus looked at the crowds, the multitudes, and had compassion. He had compassion on them. Why were the multitudes there? Jesus said later, they came because of their need. They came because... They wanted to be healed of all the things of sickness, but they would get sick again. They came because, Jesus said, because they wanted to be filled with food. They wanted their hunger to be met, but they would get hungry again. They came because when Jesus would do all these things, it was exciting, but they would get bored again. They came because they wanted to hear the Word of God. They wanted to be challenged. They wanted someone to teach them. Yet, they were very, very, very reluctant to change. As a matter of fact, not only the multitudes, but Jesus' own disciples were reluctant to change. When they saw the crowd, Jesus looked at Philip and said, uh, what are we going to do to feed all these people? Oh, we, we can't feed all these people. John's account gives us very good. He said, it would cost us this much money to feed all these people. And where are we going to get all that now? We don't have that kind of money. We don't have that kind of supply. Send them home. 
Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Oh, oh, that's not happening. Now, Jesus knew it was an impossibility with him. And he was looking to see what their source of getting this accomplished was. Their source was them, and they came back and said, it is impossible. Andrew said, all we found out here was a little kind of a lunch basket of five barley loaves and two dried fish. What is that among so many? Y'all ever heard the song, little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown. And we can win it if we come. But they weren't looking to come in Jesus' name. They were looking at what they could do. Uh, by the way, that's what we do every day. We get up every day and we live our day. Matter of fact, we're very good. If Jesus wants to come join us, we're all right with that. If you hear most of our prayers, it's, Lord, would you bless this? Lord, would you bless this? So-and-so sick, would you bless them? So-and-so is going through a hard time, would you bless them? So-and-so is having a problem with their family, would you bless them? Someone's having a problem with their marriage, would you bless them? Someone didn't get the raise at work and they're having a hard time meeting the bills, would you take care of that? We give God a laundry list of all the things that we would like for Him to do to meet our needs. He created us. He watches over us. For goodness sake, He knows the hairs of our heads. He knows the thoughts of our heart. Does He not know our needs? Our Father, who is the supplier of every breath that we have, we can't do anything. We can't make our heart beat one more beat. It's a gift from God. Every day the sun comes up and the brightness of the sun shines on us is once again another gift from His bountiful, sovereign hand. He is Lord of all. All the people of the world understand in, in our hearts we are looking for someone to meet that need. Everyone has a God-shaped hole in their life. All over the world people are saying there is a God the ones who say that there is not a God, they don't think that anyone could match them. They think they can handle themselves, the, their situations themselves. Literally, they're making themselves God, the Lord of their own life. How's that working out? And yet, the source, we don't ever go to Him. We ask for what comes from His hand. We like what comes from his hand. Heal me, Lord. Our faith is what we act upon in our belief. You're going to do what you believe. You're not going to do anything more than that. You're going to take as much of this word and you're going to put it into action in your life as much as you believe it. As much as you see Jesus as Lord, that's how much you're going to serve Him. That's the type of fellowship you're going to have. That's the type of discipleship you're going to have. But the Bible says that we are saved by the grace of God through faith. It's not of ourself. It's a gift of God. Not of what we can do. Not of works. Because if we did, we would boast, lest any of us should boast. It's a gift. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews that the only way that we can please God is by faith. That means what God wants from us is to see the needs of the world and understand that we can't meet those needs, but He can. So by faith, listen to me now. Please hear this. Please hear this. Please hear this. We move from our need to His need. We move from what we can do to what He can do. We see Him as the source, and we believe that. We trust that, and we, by faith, go to Him and say, God, I can't, but you can. That's what He was looking for from the disciples. Wouldn't it have been great if Philip or Andrew or any of the other disciples came to him and said, Lord, 5,000 men, all these families, all these women and children, we can't feed them. They need to be fed. 
we can't do it. We don't have that within us. But you're God. You're the Son of God. Tell us what we are to do. We're coming to you and saying, here we are. Use us. You're the source. But they didn't do that. They said, send them away. Let them go by themselves. Let them find it for themselves. Aren't you grateful that's not what God says? He didn't come to you and say, just go handle it yourself. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you. If a person is burdened down by the, by the, the load of sin in their personal life, and they come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, I am a sinner. I know that's wrong. I turn from that. You are the Son of God. You came to die on the cross of Calvary. You shed your blood. You gave your life to cleanse me. I come to you. I give my life to you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. You know what God will do? When we come to Him, He'll say, I'll save you. You're mine. I'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'll be Emmanuel. I will always be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you pretty good deal it's a pretty good deal that he's always watching over us he watches over the sparrow he watches over you he knows your need far more than you do you can either meet the need or you can understand that in this world there is a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above what we can do what we could even think whatever we could even come and ask of him So why do we live in a comfortable distance from Him? Why is it that we come and we say, this is the part of my life that I will give to you. This is the part of my life I'm not giving to you. I'm going to handle this myself. By the way, if I do need you, I will come and you better need it, meet my need. And if you don't meet my need, I won't believe in you and I'll, I'll be angry at you. And It's real smart, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. So he allows the situation here. He says, bring me what you have. And I, I love this. He took what they had. They brought him some barley biscuits. We're in the South. <laughs> Amen. Whole wheat biscuits. Doesn't sound great, does it? They should have brought him some gravy, too. That would have been even better. <laughs> some dried fish. Mm -mm. But in the hands of God, he took what they had. A little kid's sack lunch. And he fed what some of the scholars, I don't know, I wasn't there, I didn't count. Some scholars says 10, 15, maybe even 20,000 people till they were full. Didn't have to have gravy. Didn't have to have jelly. I got an amen from gravy and jelly back there in the back. I love this. And it satisfied. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it away. Come here, Isaiah. Turn around. He wants to bless you. Then he's going to break you. Then he's going to give you away. You good with that? Are you? You can be seated. Anybody want to volunteer? Anybody want to come and volunteer to be blessed of God? Hold on. With that, he's going to break you so that he can multiply you. My faith is not in Brian. My faith is not in the church. My faith is in Christ and Christ alone. Now, 36 years of marriage, he has done a wonderful thing in my marriage. My wife married a nut. A hard-headed, stubborn, born-again preacher. And she likes all of me. Well, I won't say likes. She loves all of me. Some of it she just takes. 
But I tell you what, that woman sticks by me. I love her so much. And what I have found, y'all want to hear a good marriage word? The more I give myself over to her, the more I receive back. If it was all stingy, I probably wouldn't get it. That's why so many marriages break. But if I cherish her, if I serve her, if I pour out myself, if I love her, if I give her my very best, the thing is, is I always get back more in return. And I have, it's almost like I try to give more to her, but she pours it back on me. Then I got to pour it back on her. And you know what? It gets good. And God is in heaven and saying, if you'll come to me and cherish me. Did you hear that? No other gods but me. No other thoughts but me. You find the end of yourself, you'll find the source. When Jesus is your source of happiness, if not, you'll get sick again. The excitement will go away and you'll get bored again. Right? The money will go away and you'll be broke and you'll say, I'm in need again. But if you find the source from whom all blessings flow, Why didn't they just go to Jesus and say, you're the one? Well, can I just say they didn't get it? So Jesus looked to the crowd. I don't know how he did this, but he shooed them away. Y'all go home. And he put the disciples in a boat and put them. He says, you go to the other side. I'll meet you later. I've got to go pray. And he goes up on the mountain and begins to pray for them. I wonder what he prayed for them. Maybe he said, Lord, help them find what they need in me. No matter what circumstance they go through. He had just sent them out two by two. And in every situation they found themselves, he was enough. But now they've backslidden back to where they were before. Maybe he's up there praying, Lord, I don't want them to be bankrupt. I don't want them to be miserable. I want them to understand the supply of blessing I have for them. I'm not talking about riches. Riches come and riches, yes. You build that beautiful house that you think is going to be the mansion you're going to live in forever, and termites will come. Tornadoes will come. The banker will come and repossess. But in heaven, I just keep sending up supplies because Jesus is building my house right now. I keep sending him wood. I pray that I send him more than wood. I pray, you know, because wood, hay and stubble just burns and goes away. I, won't, I don't want a mansion in the corner of glory. I want one block away from the throne of God. I want to have, I want a, I want a home with a view of Christ. Well, he puts them out there and he's praying for them. And sure enough, a storm comes. It is just like it. The Lord puts us in a place where the storm will wreck our joy. Have you ever thought about it? Three o'clock in the morning. How dark does it get at three o'clock in the morning? I mean, the cloud, there is no moon, there is no stars, there is no light. The storms, and the wind is hitting you from wherever it wants to hit you. The rain is pelting upon you. It looks bad. The waves, and these boats are only like 16 foot long. And they forgot their dream of me. And they row and row and row and row and fight and argue and fuss. And Jesus says, time for me to show up. <coughs> Isn't it great when Jesus shows up? Don't you wish he showed up a little easier? You see, because I'm sure when he walked up, they were like, praise God, he's here. Come join us in the boat. 
Isn't it funny when in the storms of life what you truly believe will come out? It's a ghost. Let me read the Word of God to you. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was alone there. The boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the wind was contrary. Y'all like that word? The wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. They were troubled. The, the answer was coming to them in their trouble because their theology said it's a ghost. They cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. I love this. He's just over there just chilling, walking on the water. Hey, it's me. No, read to, no, no reason to be afraid. Don't fear. I'm here. Just standing there. What are you standing out there for? Once before, he was in the boat with them, and they were tossed with the winds and the waves of the sea. They went and woke him up. He was sleeping. He was a good Baptist. He was sleeping down there. And they said, don't you care? We're about to die here. And Jesus woke up and said, oh, ye of little faith. Then he said, peace be still, because he's the answer to our problem. They knew he was the Lord that could control the winds and the rains and the waves and the troubles and the storms of life. But once again, they're afraid. At this point in time, Peter speaks up. Verse 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You know what Peter said? Lord, it looks a whole lot better out there with you than it does here in this boat. I mean, I'm glad here to do it like this, but you're out there and you look chilled. I'm cool. Can I come to you? And Jesus didn't say, swim on. He's walking on the water and he, Peter knew exactly what he meant when he said, can I come to you? Bid me come to you. He was just asking for permission and Jesus says, well, come on. One leg over the side of that boat. We're partially committed. The other leg over the boat. We're fully committed. Church, how many of us are living with one foot over the boat? Partially committed. If we were in that boat after Peter, now, Peter got out in the water and walked. If we were in, by the way, nobody else got out. If, you, if we were there and we threw one foot over, what would be going through our mind at that point? Oh, I want to do this. I just watched Peter do it. What would be going through our mind? I don't know. Can I do this? I'm not sure. Here's the thing, church. Here's the thing. Are we going to let him be Lord of all? Or are we going to let him be Lord of what we want him to be Lord over? I could list a hundred different things in your life, in my life, that aren't going the way we really hoped it would. Would y'all agree with me? And we have a God who can only be defined as love. He can't do anything except by love. 
Every person that dies without knowing Jesus Christ as a personal Savior will be separated from Him forever. In a place that Jesus said was Gehenna, it, it, it was Hades, hell, where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because they would refuse to come to Him. Correct? He hadn't rejected anybody that comes to Him. But why would people not want to come to Him? They may even debate it. They got one foot over saying, I want to go to Him, but I don't know. You know, one of the wonderful things that the preachers, I get to watch during the invitation, I get to watch the dance. Y'all know what the dance is? Sometimes we grab a hold of the pew in front of us and we go, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Sometimes it comes a little, uh, mm-hmm, 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 right? Where we're deciding. By the way, that happens on Tuesday morning when that news hits you and it's hard. We're deciding, oh, this is hurt. This hurts. Oh, I need to do this. I need to come to Jesus. And we're deciding it. Our level of dedication and discipleship. All he wants is to be Lord of all. I think it was Orberg that said, he wrote the book and said, to live by faith, you've got to get out of the boat. Peter did something nobody else did because when he got out of the boat, he was looking at the source of his joy, the source of his peace, the source of his protection. The winds are still blowing, the rains are still coming, but he is walking out the miracle. Now, when he pauses and starts to look around and says, I can't do this, what happened? Verse 29, Jesus said, come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was bolsterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I would not say little faith in that moment. I would say that's a whole lot of faith. He walked on water. How many of you have walked on water? How many of you have gotten to that place and time in your life and you just said, Lord, I need you. I fall before you. All my life I give to you. How many times have you fell on your face before God and yielded it all to him? But then we took it back. The faith walk is a daily walk of trusting Christ. He is my all in all. He is my everything. Um, We all face difficult things. We, we, We face it differently. But church, I have decided to follow Jesus. Nothing's going to steal my joy. Nothing's going to steal my, the plans that God has for me. No weapon formed against me will prosper. I know, I know the author. He is Jehovah Rapha. He can heal, right? He is El Shaddai. He is the most powerful. He is Lord. He's Adonai. He's Master. He's the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Hosts. That means He's there for everyone. You're going to determine your level of discipleship and fellowship and dedication. And the faith challenge is when you hit that wall, are you, going to go, are you going to see the source and get up and move by faith to him? 
Or are you going to just blame, complain, steam, shriek? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your works and give glory to our Father in heaven. When the light shines, walk to the light.